Oh my gosh, what has this podcast done to you? You're being reduced to watching films on your phone. Welcome to Groovy Movies. My name is Lily Austin. And my name's James Brailsford. Hello. Hey James, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, you know, doing all right. It's been a funny one researching the film for today's kind of general topic because it's been such a lovely day outdoors. And uh, mm. I, I was uh, traveling by tram, which is the nicest way to travel around Manchester. And uh, I was watching train spotting on my phone. Oh my gosh, what has this podcast done to you? You're being reduced to watching films on your phone. That is not the Brailsford way. You know what, it's so funny because I was traveling into work at the BIM film school and the course leader was like, you watched a film on your phone, James? Even they were like, <laughs> they couldn't quite believe it. Your reputation precedes you. It clearly does. Um, I have a question for you before we dive in. Ooh. Have you heard of the Wilhelm scream? I have, yes. I am very familiar with the, uh, the history and the broad usage of it. Okay, I had... I'd literally no idea. I'd never heard oh. of it. And someone at work today mentioned it and sent me yeah. a link like, oh my God, why don't you know about this? And I felt very embarrassed what with us having this film podcast. So what is it? It's a very interesting piece of like Hollywood in-joke um, <laughs> that I only heard about recently via YouTube. So maybe I've known about it for six or seven years on a YouTube video. It, it's not something that's going to change your appreciation of film history, but it's just an interesting little side note. Uh, the Wilhelm scream is a sound effect of somebody screaming. It's like a death scream. Oh. It was recorded for an action scene, I think from a 1950s Western. It's just a very distinctive sound effect. Now, I don't know when it started getting inserted into films subsequently after this one use of it, but I do know that certainly in the 70s, when we have the next wave of directors coming through, I'm thinking like George Lucas has a Wilhelm scream in every Star Wars film, I'm pretty sure. And so it became an in-joke with a lot of the American new wave of directors to insert this Wilhelm scream wherever they could in their films just for one time. So let's slip it in there. So all their, them and their filmmaker mates can be like, tee hee hee, I slipped a Wilhelm scream in there. And there's also obviously for, for the people who are really into Wilhelm screams, there's also Ben Burt, the sound effects editor of Star Wars, the guy who made the sound effects of R2-D2 or the lightsaber sounds the blaster noises that guy ben burt he has a cameo in return of the jedi and he plays an imperial officer and he gets shot and he has a wilhelm scream but it's not <laughs> the sound effect it's ben burt doing an impression of the wilhelm scream <laughs> okay well let's insert it here so our listeners know what the hell we're talking about <laughs> and i can confirm that it was distant drums of 1951 was the og usage but ah, then it okay. was used in in the 50s, The Change of Feather River, A Star is Born in 1951, Land of the Pharaohs 1955. But then, yes, brought back in the 70s, I guess, as a kind of an in-joke, like you say. Until 1968, it, it was being used from time to time. And then, oh, it says here that, okay, this is Wikipedia, but these days <laughs> we can trust it, right? It does mm. say that they found the original Wilhelm scream and inserted it when a st stormtrooper falls off a ledge. Yeah. It's a bit like, where's Wally? Like, where is the <laughs> Wilhelm scream? Well, now that our listeners have heard it, we can all be listening out for it. I'm not going to read, read out the other movies. Or should I? So you know to listen out. No, Maybe no, I no, should. no. No? Well, there's a good, <laughs> A, there's, a, there's going to be a lot. And B, why spoil the surprise? You know, sometimes it's not like... actually as many as you might think. Oh, I mean, okay. maybe this isn't an exhaustive list, in fairness. <laughs> I'll just give you a couple to whet your appetite. Um, Anchorman... Die Hard with a Vengeance, Gremlins, okay? Can I just ask, is uh, Howard the Duck on there? Mm, it's not mentioned here, but... Mm, okay. Why? I'm just curious. You... To... Because well, it... no, it's a Lucas film, so it's a George Lucas produced movie, isn't it? So I wondered if you'd be there like, hey, come on, let's stick the yes. Wilhelm scream in. Uh, so apparently it was Ben Burt's signature. So after he found it and added it to ah. that first Star Wars film, from then on, every movie that he worked on, basically, he'd sneak it in somewhere. Really? That's what fascinating. What a fun what... guy. <laughs> ben, oh, Ben Burt's a fascinating guy, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got in a bit off track. That is not, this is not what the episode is about. It's not about screams in cinema, but that could be a topic for another day. This week, we are talking about the greatest year in cinema history, 1999. As mentioned a couple of episodes ago when we were talking about The Mummy, because I'm, yeah. I, I have to say, I'm very, very proud of this, that. It was almost a thing in passing that I thought, hmm, we've done a lot of movies that came out in 1999. It's obviously a very good year for cinema. 
And then it turns out that I'm definitely not alone in thinking that because there are so many articles about it online. And it was even, there was even a book published on the subject by a cultural writer called Brian Raftery called Best Movie Year Ever, How 1999 Blew Up the Big Screen. Don't you love it when that happens, when you have a thought and then it turns out not original <laughs> at all, but every, like, it, it's kind of correct. You're plugged into the zeitgeist, Lily. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting. I can't remember when it came onto my horizon that 1999 was this classic year. I think it was only recently, perhaps. That we're making this podcast, maybe? Or do you think longer ago than that? Oh, longer ago, longer ago. Like a couple, of, a couple of years-ish, you know. But until researching for this particular episode, I hadn't sat down and gone through the list. I'm like, holy shit, so many great films. <laughs> films that are certainly in my top 50, without a doubt. And also, I saw a lot of those at the cinema. What a great time for going to the cinema. You yeah, know? So, exactly. Th that time in my life. I mean, 98, 98, 99, that was my final year at university. So I, I graduated in 99. And then I was working in the industry for the rest of 99. So in my head, mixed together is like my early career, which is very vivid, but also going to see a lot of these great movies. I can even remember which, which cinemas I went to see them in. And that's like quite specific, even for me. I can even remember going to see um, Blair Witch Project in Leamington Spa. Yeah, so, <laughs> so lots, lots of very vivid memories. Amazing. Okay, well, that's great. So you can take us back to that time, give us the, the context. I oh my god I, like I, I, I definitely I saw Toy Story 2 in the cinema that year an Same. iconic fabulous film like one of the great better sequels arguably or as good sequels but other than it, that what else what other well, movies well I, can, I, can, I, can I just say so I saw Toy Story 2 but but I hadn't seen Toy Story 1 so I saw Toy Story, Toy Story 2 for the first time at the cinema and also ah. I've just realized on on a similar theme I saw Austin Powers the spy who shagged me the Austin Powers sequel also <laughs> out in 99 I saw that before I saw International Man of Mystery so there was something about me in 99 which was I saw the sequels before I ever saw the originals well I guess just because if you you're in your final year of film school you're very much plugged into film so so that this was the year to be going to see them maybe Maybe, maybe, but yeah. Maybe the years they came out you well Toy Story there was quite a big gap between the first and second right Anyway, that's that's irrelevant. We'll, we'll, let's stick with 1999. There were other great yeah. years too, but this is this I do think is the best one. And you guys might have noticed, if you're good at maths, it's the 25th year anniversary this year. Which I certainly didn't know until I was looking at the cinema listings. Like, oh shit, yeah, it is, it is uh, 25 years ago. Because what I've noticed, because I like to every week look in the cine world and the view listings. They always do this anyway, but it's especially pronounced this year because there's not enough films being made by Hollywood to put in the cinemas. Right, because of the strikes. Yeah, yeah, the knock-on effect of, of, of the strikes meaning mm -hmm. that the production shut down. So we kind of we're, we're in that period right now, and it's and it's very noticeable that there's a. I mean, but it's a great time if you want to see classic films at the cinema. So both mm. Cineworld and View are theming them as like 1999 seasons. So mm. Train Spotting's on. The Mummy's got a new 4K version that's going to be in the IMAX. You know, there's there's lots of a uh, good classic films from that era, but getting a reshowing. Yeah, yeah, so it's a good time. So we'll run you through, uh, we can only really do a handful because there are so many, but we'll so talk many. you through some of the best and then you guys can check it to see if they're, they're at a cinema near you. So tell me, James, which to your mind are the strongest ones of this year, this, this particular yeah, good year? To my mind, thank you. I would I would say The Sixth Sense, American Beauty. Not a, an absolute banger, but I did enjoy it, Man on the Moon, mm. uh, Magnolia, and I got yes. to say... The Matrix. That was probably, for me, the definitive uh, film from 1999. For me, Magnolia, definitely. That's, I, I'm always changing what my favourite Paul Thomas Hansen film is, but that's definitely up there. And this was the year of Sofia Coppola's film debut with The Virgin Suicides. And that film, I remember watching that as a teenager. And it, it, I think for what Fight Club did to many guys in their teen years... <laughs> The Virgin Suicides did for me. I think it, it, there are things in common actually with these films, and actually that's some, that that's definitely a genre that I clocked when looking at this list. Um, that we'll get into later of kind of disaffected youth and and cynicism, perhaps that um, yeah. that kind of connects those two. But um, also, I love the talented Mr. Ripley. Great yep, movie. Same. Same. I mean, again, I saw The Talent of Mr. Ripley at the cinema, which was amazing. But yeah, it's funny you should mention uh, Fight Club, because that was a film that I just didn't see at the time, because it was mm. the classic case of everyone told me I'd love it. And what happens when people say that? It means I'm immediately not going to watch it. Yeah. Don't tell me I'm going to love it. You don't know what I do and don't like, and I'm going to prove my point by not uh, watching it. 
<laughs> that's literally what's, I don't want to be like this. It's just how something triggers in my brain. So yeah, I know, I didn't James, wa- but we love you for that. <laughs> I didn't watch it from. I think I watched it like three years later. The thing is, up. it's good to have a bit of distance and then come to it with your own views. Yeah. Absolutely. So did you did you love it when you saw it finally? I didn't love it. I thought it was good. I'm not going to slag it off. But I just. I've rewatched it recently and I still didn't love it, but I, I liked it a bit more. You know, it, certainly there's loads more films from 1999 that I love. Um, yes. Fight Club isn't one of the ones that I really love, but it's a good film. I think Fight Club is a notable film. I think part of the thing that was great about 1999 was that there were a lot of films that were coming out that were kind of mid or low budget and following disaffected men, mostly, I would say, who feel a lot of nihilism and cynicism about kind of late stage capitalism basically you know it's like the hangover or the come down after the 80s and that kind of money 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 we can all be successful and then what kind of comes later after all that and we realize like oh what and also kind of it's 1999 y2k fever panic is around so i feel like they're kind of oh, moving yeah. this idea of like fear and cynicism about the future and what the future holds i think a lot of that trickled into the films that were being made around this time and yeah. fight club is definitely one of them and american beauty as well and and train sporting that we're going to talk about i think you know and being john malkovich as well like there a lot of these movies about like trying to change yourself or change your Life. I think Bryant Raftery talks about it in his book. Not that I've read it, but I read an article about the book. <laughs> and um, and I, for me, it's it's less about like changing to become someone else and to like and being independent to solve the problem. But I think there's definitely something about being cynical and disaffected that yeah. that comes through I- in a lot of these movies, and that I think is really strong. I think that is definitely a strand that runs through a lot of these films. There's another strand that sometimes intersects and weaves through some of these films as well, which I think The Matrix is the most obvious one, but being John Mm. Malkovich, I would class into that. The Sixth Sense even, which is this idea that that the world around you is not as it seems and that actually you've been living some form of a lie. I do think there's a lot of questioning of reality or what we think is reality running through a lot of these films as well. I mean, even Eyes Wide Shut, I mean, that's Stanley Kubrick's take on the exact kind of thing. And it's interesting, isn't it, that... These were all came out in this particular year. Something about the 90s inspired a lot of writers and directors to make films about questioning reality. But also on a lighter note, it was a great year for mid-budget rom-coms. We had Notting Hill and Runaway Bride, two of my (laughs) favourites, both Julia Roberts vehicles. She'd had a tough few years with her various romantic dramas. We won't go into now because we're a highbrow podcast, but... (laughs) And she came out swinging with these brilliant films. <laughs> yeah. I haven't and seen Runaway Bride, but I have seen Notting Hill. Yeah. You've not seen Runaway Bride? No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it is great. I'm, I'm, I could talk a lot about it, but I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm not sure if you would love it, to be honest. Which, maybe that's a good thing to say to you. That might make you watch it more than if yeah, I said, oh, James, <laughs> it's so for you. Let's do it. See, look, you see, your, your reverse psychology is already working. Okay, good, good. Honestly, it's great. It's, it's Julie Roberts being reunited with Richard Gere, you know, from Off of... Off of Pretty Woman. Thank you. Off of Pretty Woman. and um, get some, uh, Let's get the gang back together. Exactly, exactly. It's the same team, basically the same casting right. director. It's fantastic. But anyway, I digress. Notting Hill's a bit like, it's the same team as Four Weddings, isn't it, really? That's how I saw Notting yes. Hill. Different American dark-haired woman, but everything else uh-huh. is the same. It's the same. How in, yeah, I hadn't made that connection there. So that's another thing, kind of rom-com, not sequels, but kind of spiritual yeah. sequels. Yes. Oh. I had such a great year for going to the movies. But um, the other thing, I had two definitely big moments. One which was a positive one, which was going to see The Matrix in the cinema for the first time. And just seeing the kind of revolutionary visual effects and the storytelling. And it just, just it was a genuinely, probably the last time I really felt like I had this mind-blowing experience at the cinema. But then, then the opposite of that was almost just feeling like I was at a funeral for something that I really loved, which was going to see Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace <laughs> at Leicester Square Odeon on the second weekend of release because I couldn't get tickets for the first weekend. And I, was, I had to see it at the, I had to see it at Leicester Square Odeon because they were the only cinema in the UK that had 7.1 surround sound installed, especially for The Phantom Menace. And so I went there and, and just I remember after 15 minutes, once Jar Jar Binks joins the film, it was like the entire audience just like exhaled this sigh. I remember I felt the air go out of that just... 
our souls, our souls just left the cinema and there was silence for, for the next two hours and the film ended and there was no elation, no jubilation. We were just silent. <laughs> Oh, wow. You've really painted a picture. God, now I feel very jealous that I wasn't cognizant enough of, <laughs> of the importance of that year to be going to the cinema. Funnily enough, I do have a clear memory of seeing the Star Wars, the trailer to that Star Wars on a particular videotape that I had. Mm. I forget what it was because I remember seeing that and being curious about it, unaware that it was a heartbreak movie that had let <laughs> you know reams of fans down because they because it had been like however many years since the last oh God, one came out 16 years i think wow it, it was it hugely anticipated but what was interesting is the original wave of fans which i would say you know i was around in the late 70s and 80s so i was like an original fan we all were just like this is the worst thing ever and we kind of like were quite sad about it but it did land with a lot of the a younger audience who now love it so when i chat to that a lot of the 18 and 20 year old students i work with um, a teach sorry is a uh, they all love the prequels so you know, the, 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 it did find a new audience. It just wasn't me. It chucked one audience off the off a cliff, and as it welcomed a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and now I wonder if the same is being done with with these films, that the the most recent uh, stable of Star Wars movies. Something tells me it, no. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, and and there's actually a very kind of clear way of reading that because Star Wars, unlike a lot of other films, it has huge merchandise sales. You can judge mm. the popularity of the characters by how many kids, how well the toys are selling. And the thing is, Ray, who was a central character of the new Star Wars films, nobody's buying the toys and they're heavily discounted. <laughs> right, gotcha. And that and that was obvious, that was infamously what George Lucas made a point of having in his contract when he yeah. created Star Wars originally, it was that he would get the profits from any uh, yeah, merchandising, merchandising rights. sales. Yeah, yeah. merchandising rights. He knew... A genius. He's a, he's a businessman and we love that for him. So, okay, Star Wars was a big flop, but the other thing that I feel like it comes through when you look at this list of, of all the great films in 1999, it's just the fact that there were so many groundbreaking movies to use mm. a very... <laughs> broad term like you've already mentioned the matrix i mean it's amazing that you saw that in the cinema, cinema for the, when it first came out because i can only imagine what that must have felt like but yeah a very mind-bending kind of topic and and the way it was filmed and and everything but then also alongside that like the blair witch project completely yeah. changed how we make horror movies because it was yeah the, basically the first found footage horror movie mm. um at least the, the first one that was super popular and, and also probably it doesn't seem to have been remembered, kind of forgotten to the mists of time, but at the time it was a big deal with The Blair Witch because it was the first film that really built up its hype and got mm. people in the cinemas via internet marketing. There was a website for The Blair Witch and the thing is the website lent into this whole idea of it being found footage. So the website was treating it like th these filmmakers had gone missing and they found the footage. So it was playing into all of that. So, it, you know, it was building up anticipation for like, oh my God, and there was lots of like clues on the website. You know, I have to say... Late 90s, early noughties websites for promoting indie films are so good. Like the Donnie Darko website mm. at the time was amazing. It's so good. Mm. It's like, it's part of the narrative. So anyway, yeah, that, that's a, one thing that I remember from that was, it was the first film where the internet was kind of given, was given the recognition for promoting it. And that's the thing. I think it it is an interesting year because it's at the precipice of the internet becoming what it is today. You know, it's at the beginning of the internet, but not so early, like mm. far, far enough along that film marketers are getting to grips with it and you know even though it's early stages it can be used in this way as a marketing mm. tool and yeah it's very interesting not only we're on a precipice of the internet but on the, the the adoption the wide scale adoption of computer graphics and digital filmmaking it wasn't really there quite yet in 99 like films didn't just have loads of cgi all over them some would but they would also have a lot of practical filmic a lot of modeling so it was mm. it was before cgi and this way of just shooting everything blue screen and kind of putting lots of it was before that took a hold so there's a certain i think this this these films they're on the threshold of like they're they're quite cutting edge and modern yet they were still embracing a lot of older filmmaking techniques so the, when you look at them now they hold up very well you know i think they hold up a lot better than films made 10 15 years ago yeah i think that's so so true okay well we wanted to talk about train spotting we wanted to pick out one movie from the year that that mm. we both love and is really important. But just before we do that, the other thing I wanted to clock genre-wise from this year that's particularly strong is Ooh. the fact that there were so many incredible teen movies at this time and not just great movies 
for teenagers, but like they had this certain tone of kind of, they were portraying teenagers in this intelligent way. They're funny, they're witty and they're cynical as well. So I watched Cruel Intentions last night to give myself a refresher <laughs> <laughs> and it still holds up and it's incredibly intelligent and very sexy in a way that I think in the years after you just didn't really see. I feel like it is coming back this year a little bit with films like Challenges, but the kind of camp fun that that movie has with its sexiness is great. But yeah, the sort of intelligence that they, they had with the humor, I think it's the same with 10 Things I Hate About You and like films like Jawbreaker. There were all these films that came out that year that just really like respected a teen audience and portrayed teenagers in this yeah. way that kind of elevated them. And I just love that. I feel like it's quite rare. Election as well. That came yeah. out that year. Brilliant, brilliant movie. And Drop Dead Gorgeous. Very funny, very kind of satirical movie about modelling. These were definitely not the kind of films that I, I watched at the time. I, I think I've watched 10 Things I Hate About You for the podcast. And I watched Cruel Intentions quite a little while ago. But I, a Dogma, which is on the list, that's the only Kevin Smith film that I will watch. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. That shouldn't be in, in the teenage <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, I was wondering. That should be but... in the cynicism Y2K section. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I bloody love that movie. My, I, I remember my sister got it on DVD at some point when we were teenagers and I just became, we became obsessed with it. I've watched it so many times. It's, it's the only Kevin Smith film I've watched. Yeah, I think I'm the same. I think I'm the same. Oh, no, wait, I've watched Clerks once, but it's the only Kevin Smith film that I enjoy. How about that? Okay, fine. Yeah, you know what? I still haven't watched Clerks. You're missing but, nothing. But I mean, look, a movie where Alanis Morissette plays God, <laughs> it's unbeatable. Okay, oh, yeah. but anyway, let's move on to Train Spotting. It was actually G G you, James, who suggested we, w we watch this one. Um, yeah. What made you choose it? It's because when I think of 1999, it's the first thing that is like sledgehammered into my consciousness when I think about films of 1999 is train spotting. It was it was the film of the moment in the UK. It's specifically, if you were a student, not even a film school student, but just if you were a student, you will definitely have seen train spotting. You will probably have loved it. So it was the film, you know, the sound and the soundtrack was everywhere. That soundtrack CD was like a huge smash and it was just everywhere. Of course, because everyone else went to see it, I didn't see it in 1999. I refused <laughs> to see it. Of course I did, Lily. I didn't see it for about five years. <laughs> But instead you were watching Toy Story 2. <laughs> yeah, because all the students weren't going, Toy Story 2 is the best film ever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so it took me a while to watch it and, and then watch it. And it was one of those things where I'm like, oh yeah, maybe you should just watch it at the time and stop being a dickhead because it was a very good <laughs> film. And uh, Well, I'm glad you chose it because it was actually, as a teenager, it was my favourite film. Really? Yeah. I, <laughs> watching it the, for this, I, it did make me laugh. I thought, God, what a pretentious teenager I was, <laughs> you know. This movie had not, very little kind of connection to my life whatsoever, but it just so brilliantly captures a group of people that in general in life are generally kind of ignored by society, right? And I think I just really, really loved a film that portrays what feels, it feels very real. It feels like there is a kind of reality to it, but it's also so beautifully filmed. It's It's not, yeah. it's not that kind of, gritty realism that actually is quite boring to watch and a bit depressing like even though it is a grim film yeah. that it you know it doesn't feel depressing it feels energetic of course there's all that running in it but you know just really electric in the youtube summary the word hyperkinetic is used mm. and uh, it, it pretty much leaps off the screen within the first shot you know there's a chase scene and you are thrown right into it and the pace doesn't stop and it's an hour and a half i was like when i saw the duration i was like, ah, a good old hour and a half, you know. It, it, yes. Cruel Intentions as well. Great yeah. year for films that aren't too long. There's so many oh. films that are the correct like, Now, the, these days, I'm just resigned to a fact it's the film, whatever film I'm watching, it's probably going to be two hours and blur in length. Mm -hmm. So when yeah. you put it on, you're like, oh, one, one thirty-three. Oh, yes, please. I'm in. The other thing that I clocked whilst doing this research was the fact that it, its budget was $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. teeny teeny budget and with yep. a box office of 48 million this is in pounds don't know what it would be today but we can imagine that's a, a lot more <laughs> a, but that's an excellent return on investment isn't it that's the kind of numbers you want to see yeah um, yeah uh, and apparently a lot to do with the fact that it had this really smart marketing campaign around it like they really especially to the US they really pitched it as this kind of Britain as this kind of 
exotic oddity almost. <laughs> this was peak Cool Britannia, which was like, I don't know quite where it came from, but it definitely feel like the Labour government at the time were kind of pushing it and running with it. Yeah, it was Blair coming in and it was Blur and Oasis. And apparently Oasis, this is just sidebar, but apparently Noel Gaga turned down having an Oasis song in the movie because he thought it was a film literally about train spotting. <laughs> Which I hope I hope that is true because even I hope if it's that's not, it's hilarious. <laughs> but but yeah, so I, you know, at the, the same year we had two very good cultural exports from the UK as far as being a hit in a, with American audience, which was Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Uh, which the film, by the way, was essentially bankrolled by the music department of Universal or something. They said, look, let's just fund the budget because we can probably make a really good soundtrack album ah. out of it. So, so it'll almost be like a promotional item for the soundtrack album. And the same thing happened with Train Spotting. It has a great soundtrack. And every student bedroom you went in, you would see two things the poster from Train Spotting and the CD of the soundtrack. That was the other thing I was going to say. This was also part of what was so great about the movies coming out in this year is that they had such strong soundtracks. Yeah, that's Cruel Intentions, again, to bring it back to, to this movie, has a phenomenal soundtrack, really, right. really great. And 10 Things I Hate About You as well. You know, so many of these movies, it, it was that time still when it made sense to give your give songs to the films. And filmmakers really took care in like having a great soundtrack because it was a great additional kind of thing to sell right Trains Force yeah. brought out two soundtracks in the end after the original release of the songs in the film and then a, a second follow-up CD of the unused songs and the songs that inspired it which I just find that is absolutely genius that's giving your fans what they want for sure absolutely watching it again I was surprised at just how inventive this film is I'd forgotten quite how every visual is interesting every scene you know the, the, there's a, a, a an interesting take on the material which I thought was very exciting yeah, it's a great movie. You've probably watched it, but if you haven't, please do. Or if you haven't in a while, give it a rewatch. Okay, so we've got to figure this out. So why was this such a good year for cinema? What what were the conditions that made all these films possible to come out this year? I, I have been pondering this the last few days. And, uh, I, you know, it's a bit hazy, but I would say from my lived experience of essentially being like, I don't know what, 16 years old in the early 90s and going through my teen, late teens and 20s in the 90s, I can mm. tell you it was a great time to go to the cinema. From the early 90s, no CGI was in any film really. Yes, I know there was Tron, I know there was a few, but CGI just wasn't commonplace. So in the space of a decade, the way that films were made changed massively and the innovations in like mm. how films were shown and the sound tracks uh, there was just a lot of improvements a lot of exciting developments and you know we were still e excited about new visual effects like seeing those bullet time shots in the matrix we'd never seen those things before mm. so there was just a lot of newness a lot of new ways to tell stories and i just feel like 99 was the peak of that We'd had a decade of medium to low budgeted films that were risky and then higher budget films that were taking risks and doing interesting things. And I look at these films as well and whilst there are a few sequels in, there's Toy Story 2 and I'm not sure there's any other sequels. So that's one thing. The second thing is there's a fair few original screenplays and the ones that aren't original screenplays are literary adaptations so the so the source material of these films so the the way films were being made is different but the source material nowadays there's a lot of sequels of sequels there's a lot of reboots and remakes there's lots of ips that aren't mm. literary sources like computer games songs theme park rides they're now what stories are being based on so i just think it was before all that started happening once we get past 2000 suddenly we start getting into the marvel era in the mid noughties you know the franchises start whir whirring their cogs and that changes everything because then you don't want to put money into small films i, I think you're totally right james totally um I was thinking a lot about what what the socioeconomic conditions of Hollywood at this time, what was behind all the things that make this year so great. I was doing a bit of research and I found this very interesting article in The Guardian by a writer called Amy Nicholson. I'll link it in the show notes. And she points out that in 1997, DVD sales began. So there was a lot more cash just sloshing around the studios because of mm. because of all these people who were, you know, they'd gone to cinema. And then on top of that, they were also buying the film. So they bought the movie twice. So with this windfall, all these studios were really willing to invest in like small upcoming directors and kind of the mi mid-tier directors who had made a few good films, but, you know, hadn't yet gone to that kind of 
stratosphere level, like Spike Jones, Spike Lee, David Fincher, you know, this was the year when all of these directors were being invested in. And so all these great movies came out of it and also had the marketing behind them to, despite not maybe being the most, the biggest budget, but definitely getting their return back. Because as you said, people were still going to the cinema. Um, yeah. So I think the intersection of that was really important to this year and kind of explains why today we just don't have that, you know, because oh, yeah. new young directors aren't being invested in, in the same way. Uh, absolutely. And Matt Damon goes into a little bit, a tiny bit more detail about what you just said, but essentially he reiterate, he reinforces what you just said, which he, um, it's like on hot, is it hot takes or hot wings where celebrities have to eat very hot chicken wings with uh, hot sauces, <laughs> yes. which is the new form. Anyway, he's, that, on, yeah. <laughs> he's on, he's on, he's on, he's on that talking about DVD sales affecting the bottom line of the, the business and how he said that essentially you had two launches of a film, you had the cinematic release, but the DVD release was a big deal because it brought in a lot of money. For especially for if your film was a low budget film, then proportionally, he said the DVD sales could bring in just as much as the box office receipts, if not a bit more. So it was genuinely a good income source. Whereas now, because physical media sales have plummeted, even though they're still being bought by collectors because they're still the best quality, and now streaming's taken over, which there's you, basically streaming doesn't pay much money, or you're a studio and you've had to. Yeah. make your own streaming service and you sell your films to yourself so you're not making any money yeah i mean it's the it's actually the exact opposite of today because yeah people aren't pa buying movies twice they're not even buying them once you know they're either mm. streaming them illegally or getting them yeah from a streaming service where they're just paying a monthly fee so it's a completely different world for cinema and so it just means that there isn't the money to invest in, well, it's partly there is, I mean, there is actually money, but they're choosing not to invest it in these new, they, they don't want to take risks on new young directors. Yeah, the, this this is the other thing, I, uh, which I completely agree with, is, is this idea that uh, talent isn't being nurtured in the cinema anymore. I completely agree with you. I mean, the marvelization of blockbuster movies, it used to be that, you know, you get an indie director who worked their way up through the Hollywood system making increasingly bigger budget films, whereas now what's happening is, is Marvel just uh, helicopter in maybe not the biggest talent, maybe talent who ordinarily 20, 30 years ago wouldn't have got into making a Marvel film, but they get them in because they can control them because they're very early years in their career. So they're not I would, really, I would they're push not... back and say that I'm, a lot of them are really great talents, but, but you know, but they're just new directors. They're new young directors. Very talented directors, but also kind of sometimes why is Chloe Zhao making a Marvel's movie? Does she want but to make a big right, budget action they film? Don't, they're not give, being given the money to do anything but that. That's the problem. Yeah. They're not they're not allowed to do their own, you know, yeah, it's not Danny Boyle being given the opportunity to make yeah. a, you know, remake Urban Welsh's incredible novel. So cinema used to be the place that high end directors got nurtured, whereas now what's happening is is that's disappeared. So if you are a director who wants to earn money and work and earn a living, you work in television. Yeah. Uh, and so television yeah. television's a different medium. It's over it's over a series rather than a ninety minute or two hour film. And you certainly you're definitely part of a machine as a director. You have much less power. The showrunner of a series has the real vision, has the real power. You are a gun for hire and you have to slot into the scheme of things. And so that's where the new generation of very good directors, I mean TV is incredible. The, the quality TV. But that would have ordinarily in the seventies, those directors would have been nurtured through the film system, and so that stopped happening because studios don't want to take risks. And television is now becoming the more dominant form out of the two things that people watch. People watch TV, I think, a bit more than they go to the movies. So, guys, go to your local cinema. Please support your cinema <laughs> yeah. and enjoy the nineteen ninety nine season if there is one at your at your cinema because it's a great this is a great opportunity to see some incredible films that were definitely made to be watched in a cinema. Absolutely. I think I might even sneak out tonight and go see The Matrix in 4DX. All right then. Uh, shall we take a little trip down to the film pharmacy? Oh James, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Well, we've got a, an interesting letter today. Uh, it's from a, what seems like a new listener. It says, hello, Lillian James. I've discovered your podcast recently and I absolutely love it. Thank uh -oh. you very much. Nice. As a physicist, I obviously love science fiction and space sagas. Oh, a physicist. Oh How very God. fancy. Oh my God, I love uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> but from time to time, I need to watch some film de auteur. <laughs> and it is quite difficult to find a good movie that is a sci-fi and that talks about science without being a Hollywood film, 
Do you have any advice? P.S. My favourite sci-fi movie is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Of course. <laughs> Are you sure you didn't write this, James, or like your twin brother who's a physicist? Perhaps it's an alternate James who's crossed into this universe, maybe. <laughs> okay, so he wants a sci-fi movie that's also by an auteur director. Absolutely, yes. Okay, well, I feel like he hit upon the best one. But anyway, James, you must have well, some other ideas. I can absolutely help you out here. Do not worry at all, because what you're looking for, you're looking for something that's kind of uh, a bit weighty, uh, takes science fiction seriously, but is not the Hollywood mainstream. So what I would like to introduce you to, like Stanley Kubrick is a great filmmaker to study. He's done He's got a big volume of work, some controversial, always pushing the boundaries. But, you know, if you want to take your film appreciation to the next level, I would say you need to start looking at the work of the Russian Stanley Kubrick, as he's sometimes referred to, which is Andrei Tarkovsky. He made two films that you could say one of them was definitely science fiction and one post-apocalyptic, but yet science fiction. So the films I'm thinking of are the original Russian language version of Solaris and also Stalker. So both science fiction films from the 70s, both deal much more with concepts and ideas. They're very metaphorical in their approach and their style. You know, you'll certainly feel the Stanley Kubrickness of it, but with its own kind of twist. Okay, brilliant. I knew you would come up with the goods because obviously science fiction is not really my area necessarily. But it's funny that you should mention an original version of Solaris, which I didn't realise there was an original Russian version. What? No, I'm. I, this is all oh. news to me. You're teaching me things. And also, ah. I've never seen Solaris. It's just one of those movies that men always tell me I should watch. So it's on my list. But which version do those men, these no, men, tell you should watch? They, they, I didn't know about the original, so they're only telling me about the new one. But it's funny you oof, should say oof. that. Yo, I'm glad, I'm glad nothing's happened between you and these men. <laughs> Recommending the remake? What the? Oh. Okay, I'm God not gonna. Damn. I won't. I won't disillusion you by correcting you on that fact. But anyway, back to this. So the film that came to my mind. I was sort of refreshing my memory about it, doing a bit of Googling because it, it immediately came to mind and I, but I couldn't quite remember anything clear. But Solar, Solaris was mentioned in reference to it. So we've got all these connections. So the film that I thought of was Another Earth. Did you see that movie when it came out? I, I have seen it, yes. I, I'm kind of vaguely interested in the career of its writer, actor, producer. Brit Marling. Mm. Yeah, so Britt Marling, who yeah, stars in the lead role, she wrote it with Mike Carhill, who also directed the film. They made it together. And mm. yes, I wanted to refresh my memory because I watched it when it first came out, which was obviously quite a few years ago. And I remember loving it because it is a sci-fi film and it does deal with these sorts of philosophical ideas that you get in a science fiction film. But it's done through kind of exploring the dynamic between the two lead characters as they're as their stories become entwined. And the kind of sci-fi element is sort of a bit in the background, informing yep. the themes that the film explores, kind of up until the end when it when it very much comes to the fore in the kind of final twist of the movie. So it's a really good movie, very moving. If you like a, an, a sci-fi movie that's got a bit of feels and a bit of human connection in it, then I would strongly recommend it. And, and it's very much in the vein of the American independent film, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's a low budget. It's not, you know, it's not a big effects piece. It's not got a, a big set pieces. Yeah, my only has a reservation with recommending it is it sounds like this. Our listener is a is a big sci fi fan, and this is more of a film if you're more into like mumblecore movies than science fiction. Yeah, I watch it, and I, and I agree with you. The science fiction element is really a way to just give a reason for the drama to exist. It's a premise that allows it, what they're more interested in is less the science fiction element of it and more the interpersonal drama part of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but I think I think we've got we've got you covered from both sides there. You can you want your more mumblecore thing, or do you want your more <laughs> epic kind of themes based science fiction? I feel like I know what his or her answer would be, but yeah, li please watch both or at least one and let us know what you think. Absolutely. All right. So thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Groovy Movies. And if you could find your way to leaving us a review or a five-star like or all that kind of stuff helps get the podcast out to a wider audience. So we'll see you in two weeks' time. Bye, guys. Bye. 
follow us on Instagram at GroovyMoviesPod or email us GroovyMoviesPod at gmail.com. Groovy Movies was produced and edited by Lily Austin. Music and sound by James Brailsford. Our logo was designed by Abby Jo Sheldon. For references and more information about the films discussed, check out the show notes.